Thank you, Pastor Carl. Good morning, church. Good morning, my church. Good morning. This is home church that we attend. You sometimes might not see me every week. And the reason is either I am speaking in another church or I am tra traveling somewhere across Canada or somewhere else or I just have a, a family gathering or something. I have always reason not to attend a church in the morning because we have a, do have a Persian church in the evening as well, every Sunday. <laughs> but please keep praying. When you don't see me, you pray more. <laughs> it means I'm doing something somewhere. Uh, thank you. When uh, Pastor Carl asked me to uh, share about uh, one of these parables, he asked uh, a team there from our church, and I kind of uh, chose this parable uh, because I am kind of a, the, like a Pharisee and also like a tax collector. Both of these in me, in my life. And uh, I, I would like uh, to share with you some of my uh, thoughts. I call the two men different attitude. Uh, when it comes to Pharisees, when it comes to Pharisees, we don't like them. Yes? Who likes Pharisees? Anyone here likes Pharisees? No. We don't like them. Sim it's simple because Jesus rebuked and warned them many times in the Gospels. We can say that Jesus didn't like them either. On the other hand, somehow we like the tax collector. I don't know why. Tax collector was, was doing far more bad things or sins than the Pharisees. But we liked them. Last Sunday on June 18th, as we celebrated Father's Day, Titan Sub has lost communication and went missing. There were, in that Titan, there was a father and son too, from Pakistan. Uh, the whole Western world and powers, including Canada, U.S., and France, tried to find and save the Titan. Unfortunately, the Titan Sub had a, a catastrophic implosion, and five people lost their lives. This is sad. The Wednesday before, on Wednesday, June 14th, a ship with 700 of migrants from different countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran began rocking, then listed and sank in international waters of the west coast of Greece. And sank in the international waters of the west coast of Greece. In the front of a Greek coast guard, Authorities have said 104 people were rescued and 78 bodies recovered. 100 children were killed and hundreds of adults are missing. Here is the Guardian paper what they write. Anis Majid, who lost five relatives in the boat that sank off Greece on 14th of June, watched in disbelief and growing anger as a frantic multi-million dollar rescue effort played out for five other men lost at the sea last week. The family are tormented by rising evidence that European authorities knew the boat was in trouble but did not intervene. Yet as they began their mourning, a vast operation involving craft from several countries, including Canada, was getting underway. At its target was five men, also lost in the depth of the ocean, but on a trip they had chosen as an adventure not one they were driven to make out of desperation. Two of them were also Pakistani citizens, but from the opposite end of the social scale, to Majid's cousins, businessman Shahzada Dawood and his 19 years old son Suleiman. The contrast between these two tragedies at sea, the scale of effort to rescue those in danger, and the global media response to both stories has stirred debate inside Pakistan and also around the world, about national and international inequalities and different values put on human lives. Different values put on human lives. We were shocked to know that millions would be, uh, would be spent on this rescue mission, Majid said. They used all resources and so much news came out from this search, but they did not bother to search for hundreds of Pakistanis and other people who were on the Greek boat. This is a double standard. 
they could have saved money of the people if they wanted, or at least they could have recovered the bodies. My personal reflection into this story, three things that we, all of us, we do enjoy in the West are, and, but some of us are desperate to get them more. Power, wealth, and fame. Power, wealth, and fame. It sounds like a Pharisees, isn't it? We didn't like Pharisees. I asked you in the beginning. No one put their hand that they like Pharisees. BBC, British Broadcasting uh, Center, in the fall of 1942, during the World War II, had a radio program series of talk covered Christian behavior, including morality, sexual morality, forgiveness, faith, and the great sin. C.S. Lewis was a regular guest on that program. The host asked C.S. Lewis, can we change the slide? Yes. The host asked C.S. Lewis this question. What is the great sin? What sin is worse than any other? C.S. Lewis replied to this question with clarity. According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride. And chastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Let's unpack. I'm old-fashioned. I, I love three-point sermon. Let's unpack this in three points. Number one. Two men, different backgrounds. Two men, different backgrounds. It can be you and me. We have different backgrounds. Verse 9 says, It also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So far, all we know from the scripture is that one of the men was a Pharisee and the other one a tax collector. So far, they haven't revealed anything about their attitude or their heart toward God. Pharisee. Who is Pharisee? Everyone's leader. They had high respect. People looked to them for knowledge about God and guidance how to live. They were regarded as a spiritual giants, more religious than the average person. They were good. We know from the gospel stories that Pharisees are all bad, hypocrites, etc. But actually, like everyone else, they are a blank slate. What will they, we do with the position, opportunities God has given them or us? I told you that I kind of a, sort of see sometimes like a Pharisee too myself. At score one, these are the program speakers, the faces and the voices on the radio and the faces on TV and all our online media. I have a live program for Afghanistan. Because people listen to them, listen to us. They are trusted. People trust me. Every day I get messages from believers inside Afghanistan for counsel, for different issues. People ask them for prayer all the time. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, James 5, 16 says. Our hosts are invited to come to speak to local churches, conferences, and groups. They are respected as leaders and teachers. In comparing our program producers to Pharisees, I'm talking about the best of what a Pharisee could be. Gladys Rempel, the host of A Good Life in Low German, says that a woman who escaped her abusive husband in Mexico and drove all the way up to Winnipeg to talk with her. Could you imagine? She's respected. She says, I received a message from a lady in Mexico at the beginning of April. She wrote that she had packed up her children quickly and left their home because it was not safe anymore. Her first goal was to cross the border into El Paso, Texas, before her husband found out they were missing. She told me that evening when we went to bed in that hotel, I did not know where I would go in the morning or what we would do, but I prayed that God would show me what I do. I went to bed fully at peace, totally trusting that he would show me. 
she said that next morning when I woke up, you came to my mind, and that's when I messaged you. She asked me if I would have time to talk, if she would come all the way to Canada. She came to Winnipeg, booked an Airbnb, and we visited multiple times. I was able to give her hope, and by the time she left to go back to Mexico, she was much more confident that she had been when she came. I pray that all will be well with her and her family. Second person, the tax collector. Everyone's enemy. They worked for Rome, for foreigner, the enemy of Israel. They took people's money. We all know in comparison here in Canada, yeah? You don't want to name it, but you know it in your heart. What I mean. It start with a C too. But they weren't necessarily honest, and many of them chose to become wealthy at the expense of people they cheated. Tax collectors didn't have to be cheaters and embezzlers any more than Pharisees had to be self-righteous hypocrites. We all have the opportunity today to take advantage of the position we are in. We can all be tempted to gain financially by cheating others, but we don't have to. At the square one, we are in the privilege of position to share the gospel. One principle for the last 75 years, one principle that we don't sell the gospel. We don't sell it. We got the gospel free, for free and we share it for free to our audience whenever it's possible. Some ask us to pray for them, like in James 5.16. For example, a couple weeks ago, a believer from Afghanistan, he called through my live show. He said, please pray for three things. Number one, that he and his wife do not have any medical issues, but they can, can have a child. Number two, to pray that we have a more hours of our program for Afghanistan. Number three, to pray for uh, Afghanistan leaders, for Pharisees, to pray for Pharisees, other kind of Pharisees in Afghanistan that they lead. And we prayed. Another slide, please. The second point, two men, different prayers. Verse 11 and 12, 13 says, The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income, but the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Pharisee, better than others. Confidence in self-righteousness, in good deeds. Tax collectors can stand a sinner. When I was growing up, actually, my dad was a tax collector. <laughs> he was actually the chief of all tax collectors in Kabul. And when I was kind of a, in that family, when I was doing something wrong, he would never say to me, why you did that? He always say, why you did that? Because you are better than others. He, that's the only phrase that I heard from him. He was saying, you are better than others. You have a better status. You have a better father. You have a better family. You have better, you're living and all. Why you did that? But you are better than others. Sounds like a Pharisee. Sounds like a Pharisee. And when I came to my kind of end of the rope, what I say, in Pakistan, didn't have, know the language, I was a refugee, didn't have a job and all, in that moment, Jesus appeared to me, in that moment that I said, I was a tax collector, and I said, can't stand, I am a sinner. Next one. Two men, different approach to God. Verse 14 says, I tell you this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The first one is acknowledging that we all sinners. Pride, self-destruction. 
Here I would like to share with you six characteristics of a proud person by C.S. Lewis. By C.S. Lewis. Here is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, a proud person has to be better than everyone else. Has to be better than everyone else. Do you struggle with pride? Lewis started with a simple test. The more, pride, the more pride you have, the more you dislike it in others. The more pride you have, the more you dislike it in others. How do you feel when you are snubbed or unnoticed or patronized or shown up by someone else? If you are proud, then you get very upset when someone else wins, says C.S. Lewis. Pride, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. There would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud. The pleasure of being above the rest. In 2014, I went for a mission trip in India uh, to debrief Afghan leaders that survived a suicide bombing in Kabul. We went, group of us, we went there uh, to India to brief them and to analyze and also to pray with them, to share with them. And every day for two weeks, I was working between 16 to 18 hours a day. And in the end of that trip, I, I came to a Delhi International Airport, and I was exhausted, out of breath, completely a different person, angry and all, weak. And uh, I was asking the Lord, Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy on me. And I approached the gate and the person, flight attendant, said, Sir, I'm going to give you a business class. And she handed me a place in the business class. You know, those who were, some of you, all of us probably fly, you know that people in the business class, they were closed differently. You agree, yeah? You see them closed differently. Like people like me, you never think that I will be in the business class. As I entered the business class, I was happy. Okay, Lord, you answered my prayer. I can rest, sleep eight hours here. And I entered there, and I'm making my bed and all. And I saw another Indian guy came, and he said to all after in the business class, and the thought came to my mind. I said, why, what got this guy is doing here? Why he got this business class? You see, in one moment we can be a tax collector, a sinner, and another moment we can become a Pharisee. A proud person is never satisfied. A proud person is never satisfied. Competing with others is not always a sign of pride. For example, when resources are scarce, people often compete with each other for those resources. A proud person, however, will try to get more, even when the, he already has more than he needs. Money sense, such as greed and selfishness, are the result of pride, explains Lewis. Three, a proud person craves power. Power, says Lewis, is what pride really enjoys. A proud person wants to feel superior to others, and power over others feeds a superiority complex. According to Lewis, we can see the quest for power in everything, from a beautiful woman who tries to amass admirers to a political leader who demands more and more influence and control. The pride fueled quest for power leads to enmity between people, says Lewis. If I'm a proud man, then as long as there is no man 
and the whole world more powerful or richer or cleverer than I, he is my rival and my enemy. Lewis characterized pride as the chief cause of misery in every nation and every family since the world began. While other things sometimes brings people together, pride never does. It drives people apart. We all experience this in our families, in our churches, in our mission agencies, and also during the history, and also in our country. Sometimes politicians are the biggest examples of this. Pride makes you God's enemy. Pride not, pride not only makes people enemies with each other, it also makes people enemies with God, says Lewis. If God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurable, superior to yourself, unless you know God has that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that it is above you. That raises a terrible question. How is that people who are quite obviously eaten up with pride can say they believe in God and appear to themselves very religious? I'm afraid it means they are worshipping an imaginary God. They theoretically admit themselves to be nothing in the presence of this phantom God, but are really all the time imagining how he approves of them and thinks them far better than ordinary people. That is, they pay a penny worth of imaginary humility to him and get out of it a pound's worth of pride toward their fellow man. Five. Pride makes you vulnerable to the devil. Is it not the truth? Vices other than pride, says Lewis, come from the devil, working on us through our animal nature. Pride, on the other hand, is purely spiritual and subsequently, subsequently far more subtle and deadly. One way to fall into the devil's trap is to use pride to overcome simpler vices, says Lewis. Six. You can be blind to your own pride. Yes, I have experienced it. You can be blind to your own pride. In his talk, Lewis emphasizes that pleasure in being praised is not pride. I don't know if you found I go to different meetings, conferences, and uh, churches. Sometimes you feel if they are not mentioning your name, you feel kind of sad. If they are not emphasizing you or bringing you up, you feel sad. That's the pride. In money situation, there is nothing wrong with trying and succeeding and pleasure someone and pleasing someone. Lewis characterizes vanity or seeing and revealing in praise from others has the least bad type of pride because it demonstrates that you are not yet completely content with your own admiration. Here it says, you are not yet completely contented with your own admiration. Problems begin, however, when you begin to delight less in the praise and more in yourself. C.S. Lewis calls pride the essential vice, the utmost evil. He asserts that pride is the complete anti-God state of mind. On the other hand, humility, I call it true self-esteem. How does one acquire humility? The first step is to realize that you are proud. The first step is that all of us, that we realize that we are proud. If you don't think you are conceited, then you are very conceited indeed. If you didn't, don't think, if I don't think that I am conceited, then I am very conceited indeed. According to C.S. Lewis, a humble person will strike you as a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. 
He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. C.S. Lewis says, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Let's repeat this one again. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Conclusion. Prayer matters. I would like to read as my conclusion the Psalm 51. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on our church. Have mercy on our city. Have mercy on on our country. Have mercy on our leaders. O oh God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundance mercy, blot out of my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with my hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. The Lord bless you.